We are ready to start going. So hello everyone uh, and welcome to the 2018 Illinois Cottage Food Regulations and Food Safety Modernization Act or FISMA Compliance Date Webinar, which is hosted by the Illinois Stewardship Alliance, the Illinois Farmers Market Association, and University of Illinois Extension. My name is Lori George and I'm a local food systems and small farms educator with Illinois Extension housed in Mount Vernon, Illinois, which is in the south central part of the state. We appreciate you joining us for the webinar and we will do our best to begin and end within the space of the hour, the lunch hour, due to the tight time frame that we have for our presenters to deliver the information Please understand that we will be limiting your questions to the text box at the left during the presentation. I will do my best to make sure that our presenter, Rebecca, answers them as time allows at the end. Uh, the presentation will be recorded uh, and I will email a link to the archive presentation as soon as possible after this concludes. Uh, I will also be sending out a link for a very short online evaluation of the presentation and we would very much appreciate your feedback. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker, Rebecca Osland. Uh, Rebecca manages government relations for Illinois Stewardship Alliance. She joined the Alliance staff in 2015 as a policy associate after serving on the board of directors. Rebecca previously worked as a solo attorney advising local food businesses and organizations and giving presentations on farm legal issues. Prior to and throughout her service on the board, she provided pro bono legal analysis and legislative drafting on several Alliance policy matters. Rebecca completed a BA in political science at the University of Chicago, followed by an LLM in tax law at JD at Northwestern University. So Rebecca, welcome. Thank you so much, um, and I'm really excited to share uh, all of these great legislative updates with um, everyone who joined the, um, the meeting today. Um, we hope that you'll also sign up for our newsletter so that you can um, continue to stay informed as additional changes are made and uh, we have opportunities for you to weigh in and, and actually participate in helping us make uh, all these exciting changes. Um, so I'll start by just introducing Illinois Stewardship Alliance. Um, we're a statewide nonprofit, and we are located in Springfield, um, which gives us great access to, to the capital so that we can um, get our policy agenda through. Um, but in addition to policy, we also have um, two other program areas. We've got a local food program that focuses essentially on marketing to help uh, folks connect with their local farmers and local food businesses. Um, part of that program features a, a directory that um, a colleague of mine designs and puts together. Um, then we also have a conservation program where we, we work a little bit more with um, the sort of conventional farm world where we're, we're helping to make sure that uh, corn and soy farmers as well as other farmers are um, knowledgeable and able to implement all um, conservation practices to make sure our soil and water stay healthy. And then finally, our policy program is where we, um, we work to change both state and federal policy. Um, we'll help out here and there if there are some local issues that come up. So if you do have um, issues at the county level, certainly reach out to us. But um, because of our small staff, we do tend to focus primarily on state and federal. Um, and some good news, the, the House Farm Bill at the, uh, the federal level just was defeated today. Um, and that's good news because it completely uh, defunded all kinds of local food programs and conservation programs. So it was something we were quite concerned about. Um, so hopefully we'll come back with something much, much better. Um, so please keep uh, an ear out for that and ways that you can help make sure our federal policy is also um, helping to promote local food. Um, so with that, um, I want to start out by talking about some of the legislative wins that we had last year, um, and then we will tie in a bill that we're working on this year to, to provide some clarification to one of these bills. Um, 
and and then we'll dive into what the the rest of the rules are regarding cottage food that haven't changed, just so that you, you're exposed to the whole um, regulatory framework for cottage food. Um, so last year we had two bills that passed, uh, in addition to a resolution urging Congress to include local food in the in the farm bill. Um, but the two bills that passed uh, were the Local Food Business Opportunities Act, which dealt with statewide farmers market sanitation rules, and then the Illinois Food Freedom Act, uh, which dramatically changed the paradigm for cottage food in Illinois. And um, of all the things I've worked on, I would say this is my most uh, proud uh, effort that, that we were able to successfully shepherd through. So I'm really excited to share it with you. Um, and then I do provide the statute citation here. Um, it might look a little wonky, but in case you want to try to find this language for yourself, I, it's really not too bad to read through, and it's kind of neat to see how it actually uh, looks in the, the legal setting. Um, okay, so just to go through this local food business opportunities quickly, um, this bill will primarily impact people who are selling uh, food that requires temperature controls, so anything that needs to be refrigerated, which would include your meat, dairy, and egg vendors, as well as some of the cottage food vendors. And um, this didn't used to be the case because there used to not be anything uh, that needed refrigeration allowed under cottage food, but that has changed this year. Um, so this, this is relevant uh, to some of the cottage food folks. Um, but essentially what this bill did was address um, some discrepancies that we kept hearing about from county to county in terms of how food sanitation was enforced. Um, one big issue that we kept hearing was that in some counties it was fine to use a cooler, whereas in others a, re a mechanical refrigerator was mandated, and in some they even said which models were allowed. Um, so because it was safe in some places to do a cooler, um, we were able to negotiate and get to a point where wherever you are in the state, you will now have the choice of how you want to keep your, your food cool. So you can use a cooler anywhere in the state now. Or you can use a refrigerator if you want to have uh, greater stability and, and temperature control. Um, but the, if you do use a cooler, it must, there are a few parameters that are required. So it has to be insulated, hard-sided, and cleanable. Um, so just picture your typical kind of igloo type container. Um, and then it does not specify how you must keep it cool, but with ice or other cooling means. Um, and like I said, it's, it's for storage of potentially hazardous food, which is defined as food that has uh, temperature controls necessary to keep it safe. Um, so that's good that now, now you have that choice. Um, but just to help protect public safety, there is a backup mechanism where if you're not able to maintain that appropriate temperature to keep the food safe, um, an inspector can require alternative cooling. Um, so just make sure you're being really careful about maintaining those temperatures. None of us want anybody getting sick here, so um, you have the choice, but just make sure you're being careful and monitoring well. And then finally, in the Local Food Business Opportunities Act, um, we also addressed an inconsistency with how counties were enforcing hand washing. Um, and hand washing stations are really only um, a concern if you're serving food. So if people are getting samples or if there's a vendor um, at your farmer's market who is actually doing food service, then that's where hand washing stations really come in. Um, and this bill clarified that as long as you can reasonably access the hand washing station, vendors can share the hand washing station. So in some places, each vendor had to set up, bring their own whole setup, and um, it, it was just not necessary to have that many hand washing stations. Um, so just a couple things in that bill. Um, a lot more in the Food Freedom Act that we will dive into and really explore uh, for a while here. Um, but the Food Freedom Act was actually kind of a fun story of how this, uh, this ended up coming to be. Uh, a little over a year ago in January, we had a, an annual meeting where folks got together and talked for two days about this problem where farmers market sales have actually been declining for the last couple of years. And that's really alarming because that was seen as um, 
the market opportunity for direct-to-consumer farmers. And so if sales are declining, that's really quite concerning. Um, so people brainstormed, um, but it actually was at lunch. I was sitting with, with some farmers, and they said, well, I think it's just that people aren't cooking as much anymore. And I said, well, how about if we make it easier for foods to be sold that are in a form that consumers are more attracted to, something a little bit more value-added, um, a little more processed so that it's easier to eat. And, um, and then we became aware of this Wyoming Food Freedom Act, uh, which has passed into law. And their law basically says you can sell just about anything under the sun without re inspection or regulation, as long as it's direct to consumer and the consumer is informed that it's been not inspected and made in a home kitchen. Um, so we thought, well, here's a great example of, of a state really uh, fostering a, its local food environment. Why don't we just start this conversation? We, we don't think it will go anywhere in Illinois because we do tend to be a little more cautious here, but let's talk about it. Um, and sure enough, the public health folks said, you're crazy. But we were able to sit down around a table and actually negotiate a way of getting quite far towards that ultimate goal that we had of, of providing a lot more food freedom. Um, so we'll go through, we, we negotiated point by point, and I, I'll explain a little bit about how some of these things were arrived at. But to set the stage for what these changes are, um, I, I'll just point out that we have had a cottage food law in Illinois. Illinois Stewardship Alliance actually ch championed this initial bill back in 2012. Um, and so we've had cottage food for the last five years or so. But the only things that were allowed were things like jams, jellies, non-potentially hazardous baked goods, and dried herbs. So a really short list, um, and it was all just within the, the category of non-potentially hazardous. Um, but if you look at that list, that really does not provide a lot of opportunity for our vegetable farmers. Um, and that was a big concern because when farmers finish selling at the farmer's market, what do they do with what's left over? They usually feed it to the hogs or they, they compost it and lose an opportunity for some more income. Um, and our communities lose out on being able to, to, to still access that food. Um, so that, that was a big concern. Um, also, there was a cap on the gross receipts that a cottage food business could receive. Initially, it was only 25000 In 2016, it was raised to $36,000. Um, however, we, we were hearing from uh, vendors that about two-thirds of that gross receipts could uh, be eaten up by just their expenses. So therefore, you're looking at only earning about $12,000 max. Um, which really wasn't a great opportunity for, for getting small businesses really started. Um, so what we did with the Food Freedom Act, um, two major things. One was that we removed the cap on the sales. So there's now no limit. If your customers love what you make and they, they want to buy more than, uh, than what you could sell previously, you have no restrictions anymore. Um, and then we also flipped the paradigm of cottage food. So you saw that list on the last slide. Essentially, previously, we said nothing, nothing is allowed to be homemade and sold except this very short list of things. When we sat down and negotiated with the public health folks, we were able to actually flip that paradigm. And now the law says that everything is allowed, all food and drink is allowed to be homemade and sold except for what's listed. Um, so if we forgot something, you know, that's where uh, we actually, it actually would be allowed. Um, so we'll take a look at what the law is currently. Um, and just to note, the Local Food Business Opportunities Act doesn't go into effect until June 1st of this year. Um, and that's just because of when it ultimately ended up passing all the way last year. Um, but this Illinois Food Freedom Act did go into effect on January 1st. So this is the law. Um, so to dig in here a little bit, um, this, is, this is the list of what is currently not allowed. Um, and we're, we're going to take a look at this, and then we're going to talk about uh, the bill that we're working on now that 
provide some clarification because um, once once this bill passed, then we started getting questions about, well, how is this interpreted? Does this apply to that? Um, and so we tr we're, we're trying to resolve all the questions that we've heard so far in the bill this year. Um, but currently, things that are not allowed, um, some obvious ones here if you're uh, concerned about public health, meat, poultry, fish, seafood, dairy, um, but you can use some dairy in, in non-potentially hazardous baked goods or candies. Um, those are dried down enough where uh, the risk is really reduced of uh, bacteria and other pathogens growing. Eggs would not be allowed, um, except again as an ingredient in the, the non-potentially hazardous baked goods or in something like a dry noodle. Um, this uh, prohibition on pumpkin pies, sweet potato pies, cheesecake custard pies, cream pies, um, and potentially hazardous fillings or toppings, that comes from the prior law that was all carved out as um, too potentially hazardous, so we just kept, kept that language in. Um, garlic and oil has a risk of, of forming botulism. Um, and then canned foods is a big category that we, we've done a lot of tweaking with, so we'll, we'll definitely talk about this more on the next slide. But um, we kept in all those jams, jellies, and everything that had previously been allowed, and then we added in acidified vegetables. What we were trying to capture here was things like pickles and fermented food like sauerkraut. Um, the public health folks did not want canned tomatoes. So this is where there was a little bit of um, looking at the language and figuring out what, what it all meant. And in the end, they decided they were going to count tomatoes as botanically fruit. Um, and so to use that explanation for prohi prohibiting tomatoes, now we're hearing that they're telling people that about cucumbers and other things that are botanically a fruit. Um, so you, if you are already trying to get your cottage food license and, and trying to sell pickles, you may have run into that. And uh, so that's something that we're definitely a addressing in this bill this year because everybody, including the, the public health folks, had the intention of allowing pickles. Um, so that is kind of frustrating that um, in order to prohibit tomatoes, everything's ended up getting into a bit of a, a gray area with them. Um, so we'll talk about that more. Um, sprouts, there's, uh, again, a risk that they'll develop bacteria cause, because they're so moist. Cut leafy greens, um, but leafy greens that are dehydrated or blanched would be allowed or froze, blanched and frozen. Um, cut leafy greens does not mean the harvest cut, and we do clarify that make sure, uh, in the bill this year. The, department, the State Department of Public Health do, does have guidance already that says the harvest cut does not count, but just to provide additional security to all of our farmers, we were putting that into the law this year. Um, and then tomatoes just really were such a sticking point. I, um, I guess because they're so moist and they are not as acidic as a lot of people assume they are, uh, they, they can create some public health risks. So we did not, we were not able to get cut fresh tomato or melon. Um, so that's things like your, your salads. You know, if you were, if you were to do a salad, you'd have to do something like cut baby greens, you know, the harvest cut baby greens, and then whole cherry tomatoes, for example. You would not be able to use cut tomato. Um, and then dehydrated tomato or melon, not allowed. Frozen cut melon. I fought really hard to, to not prohibit frozen cut tomato here, because last year that was the only way that it seemed we were, we were going to be able to get tomatoes at all. And tomatoes are such a big crops that our farmers grow, it was really important that we had some way of doing tomato. Um, so frozen cut is fine. Um, and then wild harvested non-cultivated mushrooms, there's just too much risk of somebody misidentifying. And then alcoholic beverages. So this is the law now. There's some great, some questions here. So I'm going to move on to the next slide to talk about what the bill this year is doing to resolve uh, some of the questions that have come up. Um, so this year's bill 
that's the bill number there is SB 457. Um, we just got it through committee unanimously this week um, on Tuesday. Monday was the day that I finally finished negotiating to reach a, uh, a negotiated bill, and then Tuesday we went and got it through committee unanimously. It has already passed the Senate. Um, it was unanimous in the Senate, but because we amended it in the House, It'll have to still pass the full House, and then it goes back to the Senate for them to concur with the, the amendment that was made. Um, so there's still a couple steps here. Um, but once the bill passes the legislature and is signed by the governor, it will be immediately effective. So we're trying to resolve some of these questions as early in the, in the season as we can, but it, it probably will be um, mid-summer or so before the bill gets signed. Um, so there's some things that are going to be a little bit frustrating for now, uh, just because the public health folks might be interpreting them differently than our ultimate goal. Um, but just bear with it and try to, if you, if you feel comfortable, you can try to make the case to them that the law is changing anyway, so you know maybe it's worth interpreting it the way that you want it interpreted for now. Um, but just to go through some of the points, and then we'll take a look at the list again with the changes that will come this year. Um, so this year we add canned tomatoes explicitly. Uh, that was the biggie uh, with this negotiation was getting those canned tomatoes in there. Um, but like I said, tomatoes really vary in their acidity level. And so that's where the fear was coming in from the public health folks that people processing canned tomatoes won't know that some tomatoes are safely acidic and some are not safely acidic. Um, most of the time you do have to add an acid in order to make canned tomatoes safe. Um, there are recipes that the USDA or various state extension um, offices have, have tested and they are considered safe no matter what variety of tomato you use. Um, so I really was all the way up till Monday of this week pushing to allow that to be one of the options so that you don't have to go through the expense of getting the recipe tested. Um, and then the alternative was that if you don't want to use one of those approved recipes and you want to use one of your own, that you would have to get it tested just to make sure it's acidic enough, enough to be safe. Um, so the, the negotiation then that we had up until Monday was the local health departments wanted the option to require testing no matter what. And I really didn't want to do that because I, I wanted some way to not have that expense. Um, however, it, it it, in the end, that was the only way that it seemed we'd get this bill through. So for now, that's, that's the way it is. We may have an opportunity to come back later and, um, and reduce that uh, expense by hopefully, uh, hopefully not requiring testing, but you may find that your county wants you to do a, a test. That is the best practice anyway, and I've been telling people no matter what food you're making, it's best practice and it's, um, it's for your safety and your customer's safety to get a test and make sure that what you're making is not going to get people sick. Um, but this will be potentially a requirement for canned tomatoes. Um, and then we also added canned syrup and canned fruit um, so if it's acidified, which is where we get the pickles and the, the tomatoes, and then, or if the fruit is in syrup, we realized you can do jams and jellies, but there wasn't anything like halved peaches or something like that allowed, uh, so we do address that. Um, it also, the bill clarifies that condiments are allowed, but it, if it is a condiment that contains tomatoes, it, uh, you will have to follow the, the rules for canned tomatoes. Um, we also clarified that if you acidify garlic in oil, then you can sell, you can make that as a cottage food business. Um, the question about salad dressing was coming up, and doing some more research on the issue, um, it, it did seem like it was accepted as safe enough as long as the, uh, the garlic is acidified. And then, um, Actually, Lori, George, I think you were the one who asked me this question <laughs> since, 
since the bill passed, we've distinguished microgreens from sprouts, and we will allow microgreens. Um, so microgreens are defined, and I'll, I have the definition in here later, but uh, sprouts are grown in water, and microgreens are typically grown either in soil or a substrate, and they're cut above the soil level. Um, so that minimizes, that, that changes the risk pro profile enough that the public health folks were comfortable going, uh, allowing the microgreens. And then, like I said, we also spell out that the harvest cut is not cut greens. Um, so you can go cut down your spinach or your, your baby greens, and the law very specifically says that's not prohibited. Um, and then here's, here's kind of the biggest disappointment, I would say, of the negotiation. Um, there was a lot of question about whether kombucha would be prohibited as an alcoholic beverage when you ferment kombucha and make uh, it's a, a fermented tea, um, for those who aren't familiar with it. But when you, when you produce kombucha, it can contain trace amounts of alcohol. Um, so our folks were asking about it, public health folks were asking about it, and it, it ended up coming to a conversation about whether they were comfortable with fermented foods at all. And in order to protect all the other fermented foods, I suggested let's slow down on kombucha as long as we can get everything else uh, allowed. Let's let that show a track record of safety, and let's keep pushing to get kombucha in there as soon as we can. So I'm sorry if there are folks on here who really wanted to do kombucha. I know it's something we hear about quite a bit, um, but that was pretty much our one loss in the negotiation as far as clarifying questions. Um, and then the question of cheesy baked goods actually came from the public health folks. So they, they brought up one and that I wasn't even thinking about, and we were able to um, get that incorporated as well. So, but if you do want to do a cheesy baked good, your county may ask you to get a test done. So you'd have to send it to a lab. Um, but it, it's not a mandate. It's up to the county if they're going to require that. Um, especially drier, hard cheeses just don't contain that water level that makes them as risky. So keep that in mind. If you're using um, soft, moist cheeses, you're, you're probably not going to pass those lab tests. But if you've got a hard, dry cheese, um, you, you may have that option. Um, and then we also um, we specified in the law that for canning, you must use mason-style jars and new lids. Um, there was a time in the negotiations where there, they wanted new jars as well, um, but it was actually some of the senators who, who objected to that and said, no, 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 those can be sterilized, so we don't want the waste. So that was great to have um, senators going to bat for something that we supported as well. Um, so we were able to l let folks reuse their mason jars, um, and that'll be great for environmental concerns. Um, but it is standard practice to use new lids every time. All right, so now let's take a look at these changes as they're incorporated into the, the language of the law. Um, so the parts that are underlined here are the new parts. Um, otherwise, it just copies over from what the law is currently. Um, so the meat, meats don't change. Dairy, um, we just, this paragraph 1.8 that is referenced here is the paragraph talking about counties may require testing for cheesy bread. Um, and then skipping down to the next changed line E, um, garlic and oil. Here's where we specified that it's OK if the garlic oil is acidif acidified. Um, and ac acidified is defined as well. Foods must be below 4.6 pH. Um, and, and we'll have that definition in a minute here. Um, and then canned foods, this is where there's a lot more changes going on. So canned foods except for the following. So no, no canned foods except for the following. And here's where you've got the mason style jars with new lids. 
We've added syrups. Maple syrup is something we've gotten asked about a lot, so now that's clear. Um, as in addition to any other syrups, people make whole or cut fruit and canned syrup, canned in syrup. Um, and then the big one here, acidified fruit or vegetables, tomatoes, cucumbers, um, but they have to be made in compliance with, um, with the tomato canning rules. And again, it's just for tomatoes that we have those special rules. If you do uh, dilly beans, pickled, pickled green beans, or something like that, you're only encouraged to do the testing. It's not mandated. Um, and then the clarification that condiments, things like prepared mustards, horseradish, um, or ketchup, as long as it doesn't contain something prohibited like fish, uh, fish sauce or something that is on this list not allowed, um, condiments will be okay. Again, if it does contain tomatoes, you have to follow the tomato rules. And we'll take a look at that. Okay, so continuing the list, sprouts, um, we didn't clarify here in this list, we clarified in definitions about microgreens versus sprouts. So there you've got a definition at the bottom. Microgreen means an edible plant seedling grown in soil or substrate and harvested above that, the line of the soil or substrate, not grown in a, a wet jar. Um, and then sprout is just defined as anything other than the microgreens. Um, so you can do microgreens now. Um, and then I also had a question about how acidified vegetables meshed with the cut leafy greens provision um, for something like sauerkraut. That's both a cut leafy green because it's a cabbage and it's an acidified vegetable. So we've synced these two provisions now to make sure that, that, um, that those acidified cut greens are allowed. Um, and then here's at the bottom there, kombucha. That's definitely on the list now, unfortunately. But like I said, we can still come back and make changes in the future. A lot of this stuff does happen incrementally. And um, it's actually quite exciting that we've been able to make such a big step forward all at once. Um, but there will be hopefully additional changes and uh, more foods that we were able to uh, work in and be allowed. Um, so again, the definition of acidified, the food, um, throughout the food, it all has to be a pH of 4.6 or below. And this is where I made sure we, we also have fermented foods in there, um, since that was a little bit of at risk in some of these conversations. Um, so fermented foods are in, other than that kombucha. Um, so just to clarify, sometimes people are confused if, if something's on that list is not allowed, does that mean it can't be sold at all? No. It still can be sold, but you have to comply with all the regular food laws. Um, cottage food is basically an exception to much more stringent and rigorous laws. So if you don't fit into the world of cottage food, you can still make those foods, but you have to look at what the, um, the regular commercial food laws are and work with your local health department to make sure you get all the certifications and inspections that you need. Um, and with this, sometimes pe if people are required to use a commercial kitchen, they're, they're able to find a shared kitchen space in their community. So it's not the end of the world. You still may find a way to do this um, in a fairly cost-effective manner. But if you fit within the world of cottage food, it simplifies your life a lot. And we're really excited about this bill. We've heard from, other, from farmers how excited they are. Um, this is the bishops here. They, they farm a bit north of Springfield. And they were so excited to be able to offer frozen sweet corn already in January. Um, so they, they jumped right in and, and took advantage as soon as the law was um, in effect. So very excited to see people using it. Um, I hope a lot of people on this call find ways to use the law too. Um, we'd love to make sure it's successful in, in helping people get their businesses going. Um, there was 
another change that, that happened that affects cottage food last year, it wasn't our bill, but um, it's important to know there's no more food service sanitation manager certificate required. That was, um, that was always something required up until now, but now you just have to get a federal license. This, uh, the FSSMC was essentially an additional license at the state level on top of this federal license. It was a, maybe about a $10 or $20 difference, um, so it saves you a tiny bit of money and is a little bit less administrative uh, hoops to jump through. Um, however, if you do live in Chicago, the city of Chicago has its own food service sanitation manager certificate, so you do want to go ahead and um, you can search the city of Chicago webpage for uh, how to get in touch with the city to find out more about that food. It's basically just a food sanitation license. It's not a business license. It's food service sanitation. Um, and then outside of Chicago, what you need now is this ANSI accredited um, cert certification. And you can find links for where, uh, where, that, where those courses and tests are available through the Illinois Department of Public Health webpage. Um, I always just search IDPH um, FSSMC in order to get to this link, but I did provide the link here. Um, and this will direct you to the new, um, new certification that's required. But again, if you're in Chicago, go to the City of Chicago webpage. And then um, here we'll start talking about things that haven't changed with cottage food just to help make sure you've got the whole picture. Um, there's best practices that whether or not things are legally required, they're just really good ideas. Um, protecting yourself with insurance is a great idea. Uh, most farmers markets require you to have insurance anyway, so if you don't know where to find insurance, I would ask around um, with farmers who sell at farmers markets or uh, market managers and see what companies offer the kind of insurance you need. And then even if you don't have to test the canned foods, it's a really good idea. Um, I understand the testing is not terribly expensive, and once you've got your recipe tested, you're good to go. So it's not that you have to test each batch, it's that you're getting your recipe approved, and then your recipe is good to go. So it's a little expense up front, but it's a way of really making sure that what you're selling is not going to get people sick. Um, and there are some home kits. Um, I, the public health folks thought for some reason those might be more expensive, but um, you can do a little research and see what works for the type of food you're making. Um, and then just try to educate yourself as much as you can if there are courses in uh, fermentation and you're, you're sort of you want to make sure you've got all your knowledge, you know, go ahead and, and do those kind of things just to make sure you know everything you need to know. Um, and remember, you're responsible for taking the reasonable precautions to protect your customer. Um, so you're also protecting yourself legally by following some of these best practices. Um, so I encourage all of those things. And Reaching out to Extension is, is a good way of, uh, of finding resources to help you with these, uh, these points. Um, and then where can you sell cottage food? Um, the law says that cottage food uh, is to be sold at farmers markets or if there's a signature ingredient in the food that was grown locally, the food can be sold from the farm where the ingredient was grown or delivered di directly to customers. Um, so this is a great way of making sure that we're, we're really doing local business and all the way back to the level of the farm. Um, if, you, if you do use locally grown ingredients, you have more options for how to get your product to your customer. Um, and then some people wonder, well, what is a farmer's market? Uh, it is defined in the law. Um, so it's a common facility or area where farmers gather to sell fruits, vegetables, and and various other local farm products directly to consumers. So it's not um, a festival or other, other kind of um, 
events that are open to the public. It's where farmers gather to sell farm product. Um, now, it doesn't have to be a regular meeting place. It could be, you know, farmers getting together. Um, I, I suppose a pop-up would probably be, be fine. Sometimes the counties come up with other ways of thinking about things, so it, it, it would be worth checking with your county just to make sure they're thinking on the same page as you. Um, and actually on that point, I'll, I'll just say with some of the, the foods on that list, I would still check with your, with your local health department and just make sure they're not going to interpret the law differently than you are. Um, like you heard, we've had issues with that with the cucumber pickles and things like that. If the department is interpreting it differently, you're, you're going to have to go along with what, what they're telling you at least until you can get them to change their mind. Um, and unfortunately, there is no state oversight body where you can go and say, oh, they're not doing this right because they're all independent local public health uh, departments. So the bodies that oversee your local public health department are things like your uh, city council, your mayor, your, um, your county government. So if you have problems with the, the health department, that's really your, your place to go uh, to have recourse. You can certainly reach out to us as well. It's helpful for us to know if you are having trouble, um, but that is not terribly unusual for people to think that one thing is fine and then hear something different from your local health department. Um, and it's a problem that we're continuously coming up against, so just know that 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 it's good to have a relationship with them and communicate with them so that you don't get surprised later. Um, but going back to this slide now, um, so th this signature ingredient um, that allows you to sell from the farm or deliver to customers, it doesn't have to be the main ingredient, but it does need to be kind of a special ingredient. Um, and most of the time, you'll, if you've got a local ingredient in there, you can just feature that, and, uh, and that should qualify. We've got, um, it's really exciting that there's a lot more farmers growing local grains now, and we do have a grain mill that just came online that's um, a little bit south of Chicago, and they do deliver. So even your baked goods, you could find some local grains to get in there and uh, be able to qualify for this delivery to customers. So please keep that in mind. Uh, that, that mill is called Janie's Mill. Okay, so a couple other requirements with cottage food that haven't changed, but we'll just go through them. Um, for the labels, you have to include uh, the name and address, the common or usual name of the food product, um, all the ingredients, and you have to disclose this product was produced in a home kitchen not subject to public health inspection that may also process common food allergens. So that word for word needs to be somewhere on your label. And then the date that the product was made and the allergen uh, labeling. And we have all the details of this on our webpage, so I'll make sure you have that by the time we're done here because you'll probably want to download our guide and use it as a reference. Um, and then in addition to labeling on, your, on the actual food packaging, you also have to have signage prominently displayed at the point of sale that, again, alerts your customers that the food was made in a home kitchen, not subject to public health inspection, uh, and that it might have allerg allergens. Um, as far as registration, um, the way the law is written, it basically says, no entities regulate cottage food. However, it gives local government, local public health departments the option to regulate cottage food. So most counties have uh, taken that on, that on themselves because they're the ones who will have to respond if there is a public health problem. So a lot of them have opted to, uh, to, to regulate up front. Um, so most counties do require registration um, they used to charge drastically different fees, but now those, that's been capped at $25. Um, and you do have to register in the county where your primary residence is, and that's where you have to make the food. So 
so in the kitchen of your primary residence or in an outbuilding on that property, but it's your primary residence. Um, and we have heard that, that some counties also charge $25 to sell cottage food. Um, and the law does look like it permits that. So unfortunately, you may find that you're registering in the county where you, you live. And then if you sell in another county, they may charge you $25 there as well. Um, and then I've got a, a link here uh, so that you can find your local public health departments or you can just search online for your county and public health department. You should be able to find it pretty easily. Reach out to them. Let them know what you're thinking of doing. And they, they should also be able to help walk you through what they require and just confirm that they're interpreting things the same way you are. Um, and then I just put a couple slides in here to talk about the bigger picture of why all this matters. Um, we're in a world right now where so much of our food is controlled by large corporate interests. Here on this slide, we've got uh, the, the large line at the top, the farm operators. We've got lots and lots of farmers. Um, well, only about 1 or 2% of our population, but still. And then at the bottom, lots and lots of consumers. But in the middle, you've got only a few processors and distributors. And that's this bottleneck where so much of the control and, and profit ends up. Um, so our farmers are only earning, on average, something like 17 cents on the dollar when we shop at the grocery store or go to a restaurant. However, when we buy local foods, they're getting usually that whole dollar. I know there's fees, but you're at least um, you're not having all this money come off in that middle section where, where there's all the control. Um, and the, to have another view of this concentration, Economists say that when four companies uh, control 40% or more of a market, there's no longer a competitive market. It's essentially um, you know, a, a monopoly. So if you look at this all across the board, beef, you've got four companies controlling 84% of the market, corn, 80%. So our, our food system is not competitive, and it's not um, – it's not allowing a lot of, of opportunity outside these very few powerful companies. So that's why cottage food is so important for making sure that our, our farmers have those markets and that small, uh, small business entrepreneurs are able to get a start affordably um, so that our communities have some alternatives to this very concentrated controlled food system. So I really appreciate all of you having an interest in that because we need you. Um, and we need you to get involved with the work we do, too, because it's, it's a constant effort. Um, and it's, it can't just be us alone pushing for things. We need all of our members uh, who, who do help us actually get things across the, the finish line. Um, so here's some contact information you can use to reach out to us. Here's our web page. Um, there is a way to sign up for uh, our newsletter, we are a membership organization, so I encourage you to join us as well. Lots of um, events that you can participate in. And then uh, here's the specific link for the Cottage Food Law Guide. And you can, um, you can actually download the guide there. So we'll be updating that once, um, once this additional law gets passed. And um, before I turn it back over, I just want to let folks know we're ha if you're up in the Chicago area, uh, we're having an event at G-Man Tavern uh, on this Sunday at 1 p.m., and it's to, um, to help with a launch for a, a new hemp beer. One of the bills that we're working on is to allow farmers to grow industrial hemp. Uh, so if you want to meet some of our staff, that's a good place to go. Um, and you can find information on our webpage. It's one of the top uh, posts that you will find. So with that, I will stop and turn it over to Lori George. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Hump, hemp beer, That's that would be interesting. That would be interesting. Okay, so um, we do have a couple of questions here. And um, let me get this up again real quick. 
So the first one that I have is uh, from Jackie. She is trying to start a small meal prepping, a, a meal prepping business, predominantly plant-based, no dairy, no meat. And at the moment they're looking in for to a commercial kitchen, but they're thinking of selling it at a farmer's market. Is this doable with proper storage of individual meals in a cooler? Well, if you're going through a commercial kitchen, you have a lot more flexibility. So, yeah, the farmer's market is, is just fine. Um, and if you've got foods that need to be refrigerated, uh, that first law that we talked about is what's going to help you so that you have the choice between mechanical or coolers. Um, but you'd, you'd be working with your health department quite a bit for the initial part of getting the certifications and getting into that certified kitchen. But from there, you'd be good to go at the farmer's market. Okay. Do you know if individual, I mean, if uh, thermometers are required for coolers? That's not specified in the law, so that's something to work with your local health department on. Um, we didn't want to get too prescriptive with it, um, so there still will be some potential variation from county to county in how they want to measure. Um, but we figured we'd start there and and let some best practices kind of evolve so that if it makes sense to go back and specify in the law, we'll know what's working and what's not. Okay. Um, I do have a question. It says, as far as F goes, and they're referring to the food freedom clarifications under F for canned foods, except for the following, which may be canned only in mason style jars with new lids. They want to know about canned pie fillings such as cherry and apple. Is that allowed or not? And they have another question about dehydrated pears and apples. So the, the pie filling, um, if you're doing, let's see. So if you are doing something like a, a fruit that's canned in like a syrup to do, to do a pie filling, that's very clearly allowed. Um, if you can find a way of just phrasing it as fitting in one of these categories, I think that's your best bet, but calling it a, a pie filling should be fine as long as you can um, kind of justify it as one of these categories. Okay. What um, about and then for dehydrated fruit, that's not on the list, so it is allowed. Oh, okay, great. So that's how this works now. There's A, B, C. If it's on this list, it's not allowed unless there's an exception. If it's not on the list anywhere, it's allowed. Okay. Um, what about some examples of drinks that are allowed? I know that kombucha you said is not, but are there is there a list or examples of drinks that are allowed? Anything but kombucha or alcoholic beverages. Okay. So That's ju easy. juices, uh, sparkling sodas. You, you know, you, you could think of all kinds of things as long as it's not alcoholic beverage or kombucha. That's easy enough to remember. So where and how do you get your own recipe tested? Do you know? Um, I would search for food labs in your area. If you're having a hard time finding one, um, I would ask an extension office, a cooperative mm -hmm. extension, um, because they do a lot with, um, with that kind of technical work. Yeah, I, I agree with the extension. They do carry a lot of uh, good information as far as that is canning, preserving, and things like that. I have a gentleman that makes maple syrup, and, they're, and they buy their jars and caps from industry suppliers. Can they use these rather than the mason jars? Um, let's see. So they're, I'm guessing they're canned. Well, I believe he's talking about the, I'm, I'm thinking more glass, the glass jars and the lids and then the sealers for the lids. Well, so canning is defined, will be defined in the law now. Um, and it, it, so if you're not hot water processing, um, you should, you should be outside of the definition of, can, sorry, canned. Um, and it's only canned foods that are prohibited unless they're on this list. So I would use that angle to um, 
if it's not canned, you can say, well, it's it's not a canned food, and canned food is, is what what's on the list here. Um, but that is a good question. Okay, so maybe we can try and find an answer for for Jack then. Okay. Um, and you were talking about processed in a hot water bath for canning. Uh, so they need to be processed in these in the hot water bath to be considered canned. Is that correct? Or pressure canned. Um, that's another typical way of canning. Um, so both of those would be considered canning. Um, sorry, why don't you go ahead and I'm going to tell you exactly what it says. Okay. Um, so we did have a, um, another question concerning delivery. And you were talking about delivering to the farm or from the farm to the uh, um, uh, to the uh, customer. It says, does delivery have to be delivered by a CSA or can that be delivered by home? I'm thinking, Jackie, if you want to clarify this, you're more than welcome to. Uh, I think I understand. We've um, so in the past, I think um, this section had always been described as for CSAs. However, the language of the law is actually a lot broader than that. It just says delivered directly to the customer. Um, so if that's literally what the law says, I would argue it, it goes beyond just a CSA. Um, so I, the literal wording of the law, I would say, allows people to deliver however they need to, however they want to deliver, as long as it does contain that local ingredient. Okay. All right. Um, and I've, I'll go back to the canned food. Um, so the literal definition of canned food in, in the new bill this year is food preserved in airtight, vacuum-sealed containers that are heat processed sufficiently to enable storing the food at normal home temperatures. Um, so if you're not if you're not using that process, you're not fitting in under this prohibited canned food uh, section of the law. So that that's one thing to think about with the bottles. I don't know if they're getting heat processed. Okay. Um, that would be a good question. Uh, Jack, if you have additional questions on that, feel free to email me or Rebecca, and we can work with you directly on that. Um, are there specific rules for packaging items? Does everything have to be prepackaged and sealed? They have baked goods. Um, well, you do need to have a package to have all that um, print on the label. Um, the public health departments have been pretty strict about things being packaged. Um, even when it comes to things like samples, they don't like things to be exposed to the air. Um, so it is not necessarily in the law, but most of the depart most of the counties are going to look for it to be in a package. I don't know that anywhere would allow you to do anything different. Okay. All right. Um, I do have someone who likes the charts in your presentation, uh, Jackie. I would suggest that you talk to Rebecca directly and email her and and talk to her about using some of those charts in there. Um, uh, from Jackie again, she's the one that is trying to find a commercial kitchen. Um, they are having problems finding it. Um, would the plant-based meals or meal prepping uh, in the DeKalb County be okay to make in their home kitchen to deliver to customers? Is that something that they can do since they can't find a commercial kitchen? Um, apparently they can't find anything. If you can't find a commercial kitchen, um, then your alternative to building your own is to, to try to fit under the cottage food law. So if you're doing um, food that doesn't contain one of those prohibited in ingredients, um, then you should be able to apply for your cottage food license, and then you would be making it in your home kitchen. That's cottage foods are made in the home kitchen. Okay, so the, apparently they're buying local products from the DeKalb yeah. County area, so. If you're, if you're using, like I said, signature ingredients from a local farm, then you're open to that uh, delivery option. Okay. So hopefully, Jackie, that will help you out. Can sweet potato or cheesecakes be allowed? 
Um, let me go back. To I believe not because, yeah, it's no cheesecakes are allowed and no sweet potato pies. So you've kind of hit two mm -hmm. prohibited things in that. Yeah, I figured that because the cheesecake probably has a little bit of dairy and stuff in it too, so. Yeah, and cheese, um, cream cheese is definitely more in the soft, moist cheese category than the harder cheeses that are not as potentially hazardous. Okay. Um, let's see. So I do have a response to Jackie for the uh, commercial kitchens in the Chicago area that Amy has. So I'd go ahead and check that out. I believe those are all the questions that I have. Does anybody else have anything at this point? I realize we are at the one o'clock time frame. Um, and I do have a short presentation for the new uh, Food Safety Modernization Act produce rule uh, compliance date. So if you need to leave, that's fine. Jump off. Uh, again, this, this will be recorded and I will send a link to it so you can review it later on. But if you are a small specialty grower or a large specialty grower um, and you sell at retail stores or farmers markets or you're a CSA, then stay on the line and for another 10 minutes or so and we'll go through that. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Uh, Rebecca, are you going to jump off? Or are you going to stay with us for a little bit? I'll, I'll stay. Okay, great. All right. So again, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, produce safety rules. Uh, FSMA, uh, basically with the produce safety rule uh, that came into effect back in January, it's to help you to develop an understanding of produce safety and how it's grown on the farm. It helps you to identify pathogens and understand ways that the produce that you grow may be, con be contaminated. Uh, we try and, and teach in our programming to describe strategies to reduce the risks and uh, help the farmer understand the value of commitment to Im implementing food safety practices. So the FSMA uh, produce rule went into effect for the large commercial growers as of January of this year. So the produce safety rule is a first ever mandatory federal standard for growing, harvesting, and, and holding of fresh produce. Based on uh, what you grow and how, if it is processed or not, some growers may be eligible for an exemption or an exclusion based on the type of product. So if you grow a product that is rarely consumed raw, um, such as uh, potatoes, those there are exempt crops. Uh, so there is a, a large listing of crops that are exempt. Uh, if your product is going to have a kill step, meaning if you're going to sell it to a processor uh, to have a heat treatment or a kill step that's going to allow the reduction or elimination of any type of pathogens within the food, though that also may be have an exemption. The average annual produce sales, and I'll touch on that in just a minute, and the average annual food sales and sales to qualified end users. And when we talk about qualified end users, these are going to be people uh, like the direct consumers that you sell to at the farmer's markets or a CSA, uh, if you sell to a restaurant. Um, so it's basically the person that you're selling it to is going to be a qualified end user, someone that's going to use it right away. So not all farmers, especially farmers, need to be to go through this uh, training. It's a full day training. So, but all growers should understand and take action to reduce the food risks on the farm. So let's talk a little bit about what this is. So the, uh, the produce safety rules training course is one way to satisfy the FSMA produce safety rule requirement that is outlined in the uh, bill itself. And it requires that at least one supervisor or responsible party for your farm must have successfully completed food safety training, at least equivalent to that received under standardized curriculum as adequate by the Food and Drug Administration. So what does that mean? That means that if you fall under the produce rule, you need to take or someone from your farm needs to take this one day training. And it's going to be uh, offered throughout the state of Illinois. We are starting to gear up on some uh, fall and winter classes on this. 
Um, and how do you determine whether you're going to be qualified? I'll talk to you in just a se second about that. So some of the uh, information that you're going to be learning, if you've ever taken a, a GAPS course in the past and you, through the extension office, then you're talking about worker trainings and we talked about water monitoring and testing and manure and wildlife. So the Food Safety Modernization Act produce rule follows a lot of the sim same guidelines as the GAPS trainings did in the past. However, there are new rules and new regulations that came into effect that was developed uh, through the USDA, the Food Drug Administration, and the Produce Safety Alliance through Cornell University. So the curriculum for the Produce Rule focuses on good agricultural practices and it helps you to identify what you need to do to comply with these. Uh, the same type of information is going to be presented with some updates as far as worker training and how often your workers need to be trained and what they need to be trained on. Water monitoring, testing and treatment is the biggest one. There are a lot of rules and regulations that need to be followed if you do water your crops. Uh, manure and compost management, if you use raw manure or treated manure, there are things you need to be aware of. How do you uh, monitor wildlife and animal intrusions in your fields? How do you keep track of it? Do you harvest the produce? Do you not? And sanitation programs. We talk about uh, uh, post-harvest sanitation programs and what is required as well. So how do you determine whether you fall into the produce safety rule? Uh, it's going to depend on your business size and the amount that you sell off your business. So with the produce safety rule on the compliances, if you're, uh, if you're an exempt farm, you do not follow the produce rule if you are considered an exempt farm. And an exempt farm is selling $25,000 or less in produce sales. Now, you'll see that these items, the 500K and the 25K, they are in red. That's because FSMA has inflation cutoffs. So each year that, it, that you are a farmer, each year the inflation is going to be added in with this. So back in 2015, when this first started, it was $25,000. At this point in 2018, if you are a very small business, it's 26,900. So that means that if you are an exempt farm, if you sell less than $26,999 every three years, so it's a three year average. So you take three years, add them together, divide by three, and that'll be your average. If you are above the 26,999, then you fall under the produce safety rule and you need to be compliant with the rule. So very small businesses, it's anywhere from the uh, 26,999 to 250,000, and you need to comply with the produce safety rule in January of 2020. If you're a small business, that you sell between 250,000 and 500,000, and that's gonna be adjusted for inflation as well, and now it's at 539,982. Then you have until January of 2019 to become compliant. If your farm sells over $500,000 in produce, in food sales, uh, you need it to be compliant as of January of 2018. When we start talking about water, since water is a large portion of the trainings that we have, the water compliance dates in the initial rule were set. However, at last year, they were talking about water compliance dates and get getting proposed rules so we can have those dates extended. And the reason they want to extend them is because the initial information that was that came out during the produce safety rule was very confu excuse me confusing, uh, not only for some of the trainers but for the uh, farmers as well. And so in order to uh, extend the time frame, so this this confusion can be eliminated. This, the proposed rules state, and this is going to be based on the business size, that the water compliance dates are going to be different. So the compliance dates we talked about in the last slide for most produce is going to stay, but your proposed water compliance dates are going to change, and that 
it is a proposed rule. It has not been finalized at this time. So the how this reads is that if you are example in all other business and you sell over five hundred thousand dollars you would have until 2022 to begin taking water samples and this makes more sense when you start going through the produce safety rule trainings if you have information or you need information on the produce safety rule of FISMA produce safety uh, this is the Produce Safety Alliance through Cornell University. This is where a lot of your trainers go to get information. Uh, the website is there. It's through, like I said, Cornell University. When you go on to the website and you go to the next slide, it's going to give you grower training courses. So on the left, you'll see the training and you can choose what it is, who should attend, what to expect, and it gives all this good information as far as whether you need to be qualified or not and then once you go on there then it's just below that it says upcoming grower trainings and when you hit that one it's going to give you all the trainings that are going to be offered uh, throughout the United States and internationally so keep in mind that everything that we are requiring our farmers to do here in the United States we are also requiring farmers to do overseas if they're sending the food into the United States. And so if you're interested and want to know whether there is any good uh, grower trainings coming up, this would be an excellent place to start looking at. So in Illinois, there are three trainers in Illinois for the Produce Safety Alliance. Myself and my address is there. And again, I'm in the Mount Vernon area, Zach Grant. Uh, he is in the Cook County, Chicago area. He is also a lead trainer in Illinois. So if you have any questions or concerns con on the Produce Safety Alliance and whether you need to qualify or not, or whether you're looking for additional information, you can contact Zach as well. And the third one is James Thury. He is in the Kankakee area. Uh, he would be more than happy to help you out to determine, to help you to determine or, or direct you to some of these grower trainings. If you are in the central Illinois or south central or southern Illinois area, there is a PSA training, uh, authorized training on August 13th in Mount Vernon, Illinois. And I did include the website there to, uh, so you can go in and register. Uh, the nice one about this one is that the first 10 registrants for this training will have uh, the training manuals paid for. So it's a $50 value, so you'd register, and then on the back end, I would go ahead and refund that $50 for that manual. So again, it's only the first 10 people that register that will be able to access this, um, this grant from Southern Illinois University. So um, other than that, it, it was quick and dirty. Uh, if you have information or you want more information, then feel free to uh, go ahead and contact myself. Uh, we do have a few more questions that came in here. Uh, let's see. This is for you, Rebecca. What about pies or pumpkin pies that use non-dairy ingredients? Will they be able to be sold um, through farmers markets and all? Um, I think that was specifically on the list. Do you, I'm going to go back just so I can okay. show you while we talk about it. Um, did that did that move the screen for you too? No. no. Okay. Which one are you on? Um, I Just am on, okay, pumpkin pie is specifically listed under D on slide 11. Okay. Um, so it doesn't matter if it has dairy ingredients, pumpkin pie is considered too moist uh, and potentially hazardous. Okay. All right. Uh, I have someone that said they cut the fruit. Can they make like fruit cups and do it that way? The only cut fruit that is not allowed is uh, melon. Melon. And if you're going to do cut fruits, uh, I believe, if I'm incorrect, let me know, but I believe they have to cut it at home and package it or put it in a container at home and then bring them to the market. They can't do it at the market. Am I correct or incorrect on that? Yeah, if you do. If you were to do it at the market, you'd be in a different category. You'd be a food service vendor, and and then that is a whole different uh, set of regulation. Okay. So package it at home. 
There is an option to do samples on the spot at the market, but you do need to get a sampling permit to do that. Um, there's okay. more information about sampling permits on our web page as well. Okay. Um, and where can we get information on the new cottage fill bill, uh, food bill that is proposed? Um, following our signing up for our newsletters would probably be the best bet. Um, there's some uh, story articles we've written that we've posted on our web page. Um, you can also go to ilga.gov and search for the bill number um, SB457, and that will bring up the language for you. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions at this time? Okay. All right. So if not, I'd like to thank Rebecca uh, for the great presentation and sharing your expertise with us. And I'd like to also thank everyone for joining us on this webinar. I hope you got some information that will help you in your, in your small farm endeavors uh, for 2018 season. Please look for an email from me for a link with the archived webinar, as well as a very short evaluation of the webinar you just watched. Uh, we do look at your feedback and use it to shape our future webinars and workshops. Uh, with that, I wish you a fabulous rest of the day and a productive growing season in 2018. Thank you for joining us.